Hello, all, and uh, welcome to our evening celebrating the work of Dr. Paul Farmer, the extraordinary global health pioneer and co-founder of Partners in Health, who died this past February. Specifically, tonight we're devoting the next hour to memories and stories from a few glorious souls lucky enough to work with him that highlight the impact of his work here at Dartmouth itself. As many of you know, in July of 2019, Dr. Jim Young Kim came to Dartmouth as its 17th president. Not only was he the first medical doctor to serve in this role here, he was the first Asian American president of any Ivy League school. And he was one of the other co-founders of Partner in, Partners in Health. What did that do for Dartmouth? It immediately drew the school into the swirl and eddy of global health and social justice through the honing of public health around the world. Initiatives and programs sprang up around campus, leveraging the connections of the new addition to Parkhurst. And with him came Paul Farmer. We cannot ever quantify the impact this combination had on the path of our wonderful college on the hill. Through the snippets of memory shared this evening, we'll start to get an inkling of that effect. Jim Kim was very sorry not to be with us this evening for the program and asked that we send on a recording of this hour to him. So why are we all doing this? There have been multiple services and events surrounding his life, and those have already happened locally and elsewhere around the world. It was only after a long conversation with Dr. Brian Remillard, we realized we wanted two things. First, there are many people still grieving in different ways. COVID has affected so many elements of our normal lives and none more so than the grieving process. By providing a space for the public processing of grieving and reconnecting those still feeling the pangs, we start healing more quickly. Second, we want those as young, yet unfamiliar with his work and the indomitable force he brought to the quest for health equity to know more. We want the next Paul Farmer to hear these stories and know that they too can make a difference. So two goals for tonight, healing and inspiration. If even a bit of either comes to any one of you during this, either here in the room or online watching, we will have succeeded. Our guide for this process tonight starts with the gentleman that I spoke of early, Dr. Brian Remillard. He will begin and end this session as we wend our way through just a sliver of the voices of Paul. We ask each of one of our speakers to introduce themselves, along with their role, to give context to the listeners not as well-versed with this world of global health. And speaking of which, I am Don Carey, the Associate Director of Global Health here at Dickey Center. Brian, will you begin? Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Remillard. I'm a kidney specialist at Dartmouth. I want to thank Dawn and the Dickey Center for inviting me and putting this together. Um, I'm so glad to be together with everyone who loved and who were touched by Paul. I remember the solidarity of everyone, the college, the medical school, the hospital, working together I remember Dartmouth stands with Haiti. It was, a, it was an incredible time at Dartmouth where we showed how working together we could have this incredible impact. So what have I been doing since Paul's um, passing? I've been binge watching Paul lectures on YouTube, uh, mainly to hear his voice and hopefully to garner some wisdom as I now feel a pressure to carry on his work but also to be true to it. Fortunately, he left a roadmap of lectures and writing liberation theology, preferred option for the poor, pragmatic solidarity, accompaniment, no pessimism on behalf of the poor. Paul embodied these words, but he taught it to all of us. I miss him, we miss him. To be around him, talk with him, text him, was to be around a powerful spirit. Even for someone like me who's not religious, I wish I could pray and get an answer from Paul about some of the issues I'm facing with my work in Haiti. Instead, I look down at my phone and imagine opening what's up and all the, the still non-deleted messages I have from him. And I imagine writing him my question, 
and I imagine his response. I want to reflect on some of my interactions with him and some of the patients we cared for together. I know he built huge and wonderful systems that have saved millions of lives, but many of the interactions I had with him were around specific patients. We first met a few days after January 2010 earthquake in Haiti. I had taken a Learjet to Haiti filled with dialysis supplies and other things to the Toussaint Louverture Airport, which was controlled by the US military. The airport buildings were partially in ruins. I met Loon Viode, his executive director for Zami La Santé in Haiti. She said, Paul is coming to meet you. To be honest, I didn't know much about his work or I didn't know much about him. He arrived, we pulled up two lawn chairs outside the airport building and we sat outside because the buildings weren't safe. He texted on his Blackberry, you remember those, for six hours, only looking up at me once to say, I'm sorry. I already felt his spirit solving the innumerable problems he was facing for his team in Haiti. I just said, that's okay. We got in an SUV later on in the dark of night and we went to General Hospital in Port-au-Prince. He continued to text. He looked up once and he said, I hate administration. Mm -hmm. And he pointed to the front seat and he said, that's what he's here for. I can imagine how many administrative decisions Paul had to make in his life, and it wasn't his favorite thing, but he did them. At General Hospital, it was a beautiful tropical night in Haiti, except the patients were all outside. They were moaning, and they, someone died right behind us, and they threw a sheet over him. No one wanted to be inside because the buildings were all unsafe. Paul texted for another several hours, and then he sent me to sleep in a building in Port-au-Prince. He had me come to dialyze a patient, Josette, and all the people have agreed I could use their names. Josette, whose legs were crushed during the earthquake and who needed amputation, she was in need of surgery but had dense renal failure. It was consistent with his approach to global health. That is, every individual is so important, we should mobilize whatever resources we can to save them. In Haitian, we say, tout moon c'est moon. Everybody is a person. This was my first lesson from Paul <clears throat> and my, <clears throat> my introduction to global health. A few years later, on a trip to Haiti to meet with the only pediatric nephrologist in Haiti, Judith Exantis, she met me at the airport and said, I have a kid at Tabar I want you to see, Kiki, a six-year-old boy who had no urine output for four days. Without treatment, he would die. I called Paul, which I rarely did. Should I take this kid to the hospital at Mirabelle, which he had built miraculously in Haiti. And, and we didn't have pediatric catheters or dialyzers, and we had never done this before. He said, um, he, he accompanied me, and, and he said, of course you should. 14 treatments later, and a month after I left Haiti, Paul sent me a picture of Kiki sitting on his lap in the garden outside the, uh, outside the um, pediatric ward at, at Mirabelle. More recently, on August 2021, I was on the beach in Wellfleet on vacation. Another earthquake hit Haiti, e e almost as devastating but unnoticed by the world. I texted Paul, our medical residents at Mirbley can handle a lot of renal failure and crush injuries. So proud of the progress since 2010. He texted me that he felt the team would benefit from my uh, being there with them to, for moral support. I ended, ended up in Haiti the next day. I really was looking forward to working with Paul for the first time, but I missed him. He, he said, I have to go back and take care of my day job, which he frequently said. <laughs> when I got there, I, I'll just share two anecdotes. One, there was somebody, something called Paul's Kids. He had picked up a bunch of kids from, from the south of Haiti who had fractures and had lost their parents and just put them in the car and brought them back to the hospital and left them in a ward. And my job was to go and make sure they were okay. And I remember, I, I found you could buy popsicles in Haiti. And so I, I, his, one of his kids was a, this 13-year-old boy named Etienne, who reminded him of his son. And I remember, he, as he was eating his popsicle, I FaceTimed with Paul. And it was like, you could see the magic of Paul's voice in this kid who, who, who just said, Dr. Paul. At 3 a.m. in the morning, I was called to the emergency room. There was a 26-year-old Haitian who came in with terminal renal failure and two residents who I'd known now for six years, we were faced with, do we let this kid die? Because we can't really treat terminal kidney failure in Haiti. 
So we dialyzed him. I called Paul the next day and said, I'm not sure what we're going to do with this kid. I feel like I have his life in my hand. And he just said, you do. I thought he could snap his fingers and it would be like magic powers and get him transplanted. But he couldn't. I called Dartmouth. They couldn't transplant him. I called Beth Israel. They couldn't transplant him. Finally, the Brigham agreed to transplant him for, for, uh, for the cost of the procedure. We raised the money in one day, and I suspect Paul partially contributed. This kid's now at the Brigham. He's been there for two weeks. He's a lot sicker than we thought, and it's going to take a lot more time to get him ready for transplant. But that was one of the last projects I work on with Paul. Our grand project is to show that transplant can be done in poor countries for a very, very low cost, and I believe that's still possible. One week before his passing, we did an online global health conference together for pediatric nephrology. He FaceTimed me at 7 in the morning to prep for the conference, so I basically had breakfast with him. We talked about Mickington, this young man. We talked about the problems at home. He was at Butaro, and we, I had never uh, known about his work, and I uh, talked to him about his work in Rwanda, but he stayed in touch with me about two patients with renal failure over the course of the week on What's Up. And one of the patients had AIDS and died, and he texted a picture of he with a father comforting, comforting him, and we were all very sad. But the, the last text, one of the last texts was he sent to the team, to the two young medical residents who were on the team, and he said, I realize this is likely the first time you've been involved in end-of-life care. Just wanted to check in. It's normal to have multiple emotions at this time, and important that you know that you do not have to deal with them on your own. So I think that's the message for us. Brian, thank you very much for sharing those. These are all, as I said, snippets of memories that are going to follow this 3D version of Paul and his impact as we go through. Our next speaker, actually, it's, I'm, I think, 11 at night where she is. This is Dr. Agnes Beneguajo, and uh, she has been a strong partner of Dartmouth for many, many years. Dr. Agnes, if you could introduce yourself and share your story. Welcome, and thank you. Good evening, uh, everybody. It's my pleasure uh, to join you today for this important uh, session to honor Paul, our late chancellor, a social justice champion, a global health visionary, my friend. Uh, I'm the vice chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity. And this is the last project I have with Paul and uh, it's five years now. And uh, um, we, no, seven years, sorry. Uh, and um, I want to say that the entire family of the University of Global Health Equity, uh, imagine that they are behind me because we are all very comforted in the, by the solidarity, the message of love, the respect, the tribute from around the world, just like this gathering is uh, one of them. And this show Paul's impact in global health. And most importantly, it uh, reassure all of us that his legacy will continue. Because all the global health fighters uh, will do that because he has transformed all of us forever. I first met Paul in 2002 where, during my first trip in New York at the United Nations, during which we were set to discuss the Millennium Development Goal. In that meeting, I, I, I knew, in fact, nobody. It's the first time I was um, in such a meeting, and I love the way Paul raises this agreement in defense of the vulnerable, presenting real facts on the challenges faced uh, by low-income countries vis-a-vis uh, -vis the fight against HIV AIDS. A knowledge and an attitude uncommon at that time among the white Western people. But Paul gets it all. His argument and aspiration for global health equity align exactly with mine, provoking mutual trust immediately and the desire to work together. And we immediately became friends. 
because we understood that we had the same vision of equity, dignity of life, ownership, and universal health coverage. We understood immediately that we were sharing the same mission and we began to collaborate the same year. And that's how it came. It's through the, the next meeting of the, uh, the Millennium Development Goal Project that was held in Rwanda, that he came in Rwanda and say, I like this country, I would like to work here. And what I did, I brought him immediately to the minister uh, of health at that time, and it was done. In 2005, Paul inaugurated Rinkwavu District Hospital. He mobilized the funds to renovate and extend that hospital for, by fourfold. At that time, uh, I was the head of the National AIDS Control Commission for four years. And after, uh, I became permanent secretary and minister of health, permanent secretary during four years, three years, and minister of health during five years. And I'm here seven years, vice chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity. During all those years, several times a year, we work with Paul on many projects. And as Rwanda, we were very pleased by the fact that Paul also chose Rwanda as one of his home. He lived here during eight years uh, and uh, raised his kids here up to the need to bring them back in the US for secondary school. And uh, <clears throat> support the work we were doing in the Ministry of Health for the decentralizing for decentralizing the quality health services, delivering services in three districts out three out of the thirty we have, and supporting three hospitals in Kwavu Kirehe and Butaro, where I am now. You know, if you see this where I am now, the studio Paul lived in here is the studio is I mean the first first floor is was just um, at the, the the ground floor so Paul strive to extend quality care and his last project is to do that through a very strong university by transferring quality academic knowledge and clinical skills and creating a model for low income countries. And what is good? Our university has already after uh, seven years of existence being recognized by UNESCO as a model and a solution for low income countries. He loves interacting with each and everyone, with the sweepers, the parents, the caregiver, and above all with the patient and the student. It was, <clears throat> often leaving the hospital at 11 p.m. and even past midnight while waking up very early in the morning to teach and to interact with patients. He enjoyed teaching, always putting emphasis on aligning quality clinical services with cultural humility, curiosity, love, compassion, and social justice. This is what he did here in Butaro during the last month of his life. We are comforted by the fact that Paul died while doing what he loved the most, serving the vulnerable in remote area and teaching bright young people. And less, uh, like one of a uh, uh, former student uh, of Paul says, always taught, it always taught students how to help people and going beyond the bedside even those, especially those who have no resources. We need to keep his legacy alive and we, con and we contribute here by training our students to deliver equ equitable healthcare beyond the white coat of clinician, leaving no one behind. And as academician, it is our duty to pass on our student, this type of quality education embedded in social justice and in connection with humanity. And as the one who speak just before, 
tout monde is moon. Tout être humain est important. Everybody, every human being is important. And for Paul, you are precious just because you are a human being. So we will always miss our dear beloved Paul. And I'm very happy to share that with you, my friend from Dasmus. Dr. Agnes, thank you so much. I, uh, I also like your country and I also wanna work there. I think everybody who goes there feels that way. And you and Paul were very generous in creating so many opportunities for us. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for spending this time with us and spreading the word. Our next speaker is Dr. Joe O'Donnell. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. Um, my name is Joe O'Donnell, and for almost 40 years, I was in uh, uh, medical school, um, 35 of them as, as a, a dean, an associate dean at the medical school. I also was a medical oncologist at the VA hospital for more than 40 years, too. Um, I first encountered Paul um, when uh, students of ours used to go to uh, the School of Public Health at Harvard, and so many of them who went there gravitated to the global health track. There were so many students interested in global health through the 80s and 90s, and so many of them gravitated towards Paul's program. Um, and what amazed me about that was Paul would call me and talk to me about these students. And uh, he knew more about those students than anybody. He just got to know them. And what he did was he uh, got to know their strengths and he got to really celebrate them and to push people towards their strengths. And, and it taught me a lot uh, about dealing with students, actually, uh, that uh, everybody has their strengths. And sometimes these students had strengths that Paul noticed that they didn't even know about. And he pushed them to uh, be, a, he was a great mentor and he pushed them um, to uh, really great success. And um, so anyhow, Global health was a big thing for these students, and, and Paul's mentorship was really important. But later on, I, I met him in person. Um, my, uh, I, I was uh, awarded a fellowship by what's called the Hitchcock Foundation here. It's for mid-career people who want to do something a little different. And this fellowship uh, was um, uh, allowed me to go to Harvard. And what I was going to do is learn how to teach um, literature and medicine uh, under the uh, the tutelage of, of who was my mentor, Dr. Robert Coles. And, um, and so I did that. And when I went down there, Dr. Coles, I would go there on Tuesdays, and Dr. Uh, Coles would say, you know, there's something going on over at the medical school that you ought to partake of. Um, the medical school has this task force that's uh, looking at uh, how to teach about um, uh, uh, the social determinants of illness uh, and service learning. Uh, and, and social justice. And so um, the head of it was one of uh, uh, Coles' mentees, a guy named Larry Ronan, uh, who was a doctor from the, um, from the Mass General Hospital. Uh, and I asked Larry if I could go. He invited me. And I used to go and sit in the back as the people were deliberating. And it was a dream team of people delivering. Arthur Kleinman, who was the head of the social medicine department, Jim Kim, uh, Jim O'Connell, uh, and Paul. Uh, but Paul's voice was unbelievable, and it's the first time I ever heard about health equity, uh, the term health equity. Uh, uh, the, first, the first time I, I heard about accompaniment, and I'll talk more about that. That was, the, that was really his driving mantra, accompaniment. And um, I heard about liberation theology and Paulo Freire and the people that really had influenced him. You know, and myself, I was trying to figure out my own Catholicism and stuff like that, and I think Paul was too. You know, he called himself a lapsed Catholic, but he was always hanging around with these priests, and, and he was driven towards, um, you know, uh, uh, liberation theology of the service to the poor. Jesus had done his work by serving the poor, and that was Paul's mantra too. That was his life. And so um, I learned so much from those, those experiences. Um, then uh, Paul came to Dartmouth uh, a number of times. He was actually the Helmut Schumann, the same one that gave me, the, gave me that fellowship. 
uh, had an annual lecture on healthful living, and Paul was one of the uh, speakers at that, uh, which was an event. Uh, the, the auditorium was so jam-packed. This was uh, just after um, the book had been published, uh, Mountains Beyond Mountains, so everybody wanted to meet Paul. And I remember I was in the party that was leading him towards the, uh, the auditorium, and he stopped and talked to every person. I never thought we were going to get him to the, to the podium, uh, but it was every person was a person, and, uh, and, and he locked in on people and just uh, talked to them. Um, he talked to me then about one of his protégés, uh, Deo Gracias, who was a, a student he wanted to help try and get into Dartmouth Medical School. Deo uh, uh, was a medical student in Burundi, uh, and during uh, the genocide, he was actually in the hospital as a third year student, uh, when uh, the rebels came and they killed everybody in the hospital, he hid uh, and escaped. And actually, um, uh, Tracy Kidder wrote the sequel to Mountains Beyond Mountains uh, called Strength and What Remains about Deo and his whole experience. Deo eventually escaped Rwanda, uh, arrived in uh, penniless in, in New York, was homeless on, on, um, on, in Central Park, and. Uh, then lived in a like a crack house in in um, in um, Harlem, and uh, later was uh, as he was delivering groceries was sort of adopted by a by a family you know in the West Side Upper West Side, and uh, he, they saw the potential in this person. He got into Columbia School of Public Health, and and then went uh, wanted to work with Paul at Partners in Health, but Paul wanted to see him finish his his career, his uh, medical school career, and so. Um, we worked together to try and get him into DARP, and then finally we did. Uh, but Deo uh, couldn't escape the thoughts of the genocide, and also couldn't uh, leave Burundi behind. And one of the things he ended up doing while he was in medical school is he was possessed by this. He started a clinic in Burundi called Village Health Works, which is still thriving, I think, right now. Um, he didn't finish medical school here. Um, he, he's, he's, uh, I, I've lost touch with him, but uh, but uh, we had lots of conversation with with Paul about Deo and his potential and seeing the goodness in in him. So Paul taught me many things. He taught me to respect um, everybody and see the best in them and the better angels of their nature and try and uh, try and bring that out of people. Um, he taught me about accompaniment. I think that word is just so important in his life that that. Um, the, the, the thing I, I think I've heard the people have said, I, I saw the, the Lions Club do this uh, here in Hanover, do this uh, um, toast, and they take the mug and they go, not above you, not below you, but with you. And that was sort of the mantra that Paul had, I'm with you, we're human beings together. And um, I love the stories that Tracy, who I got to know uh, quite well when he was trying to um, find the Deo story, um, would say, Paul is crazy. You know, we'd walk for seven hours to see these two patients. And, and I'd say to Paul, and this was in the New England Journal, I'd say to Paul, what, couldn't you do, uh, be seeing many more patients with your time if you weren't going to see these two patients and seven hours away? And he said, but who's going to see those two patients? You know, and, and who's going to see them? Everybody needs to have care, and and that was Paul's, I think, mantra. Everybody needs to have care and good care. Um, up here, uh, one of the things I, I I founded and then ran was something called the Schweitzer Fellowship Program, and I became very enamored of Albert Schweitzer and what he did. Um, uh, but he didn't have the tools that Paul did or the or the know-how. Uh, there's the story of the person who sees the people uh, floating down the river and almost drowning and goes out and picks them out. And, uh, and that's what Schweitzer was able to do during his time. He would rescue the people that were in the water, struggling. And what Paul did said, I'm going to go back down to the, see who the heck is throwing them in. And so he went uh, uh, to the, to the uh, roots of what the causes were and really took it to a new, Schweitzer stuff to a new level. Uh, and uh, very um, effective in, in the things he did. As, as, doc, as Dr. Agnes said, you know, the, the stuff that he's been able to do in, in structural changes in Haiti and Peru and in Rwanda have just been unbelievable. Um, so uh, I'll finish by saying that, that uh, the, the thing I love that's been said about Paul 
um, is, is that he was an extraordinary person who thought everybody he encountered was an extraordinary person. That's the way he lived. Uh, I'm so glad I got to know him, and I'm so glad that he touched Dartmouth. Uh, he left us a better place, as he left many places in the world. Uh, and we'll continue to go on with his spirit, which, will, uh, will, which has been instilled in us. So thank you. Thank you so much. I was very struck by the pushing people towards their strength piece. It sounds like we're feeling a lot of that in this room right now. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lisa Adams up to share her story. Thank you. Thank you, Don. So I'm Lisa Adams. I'm the Associate Dean for Global Health at the Medical School. I'm a professor of medicine in the Infectious Disease and International Health section, director of the Center for Global Health Equity, and faculty lead at the Dickey Center for the Global Health Initiative. And I share all those titles only so you can see and you can imagine how many crossovers and intersections I had with Paul Farmer, both personally and professionally. So I want to start by thanking all of you for being here. It really does me good to see so many friends, both virtually and in person. The loss of Paul has been particularly difficult because it's coming in the backdrop of so many other losses that we've experienced over the last two years. And as Don alluded, being able to grieve together communally within our Dartmouth community feels like the right thing to be doing at this time. Like all of you, I was stunned and heartbroken to learn about Paul's passing. It was way too soon to lose our dear global health colleague, friend, and hero. It seems so obvious to those of us who knew Paul and his life's work to say this, but it bears saying over and over again, Paul forever changed the course of public health and healthcare delivery for people living in resource-limited settings, both here in the US and abroad. I know I will always remember Paul's incredible generosity with his patients, his learners, and his colleagues. He was such a stalwart and constant advocate for health and health care as a right and not a privilege. And as we've heard, he was such a stalwart and constant advocate for each and every one of his patients. And because of that, what I referred to as the, the Paul way of working, his work directly and indirectly touched the lives of so many individuals, families, and communities from Boston to Haiti to Peru to Rwanda and to many of us connected here at Dartmouth. So I first met Paul almost 30 years ago in 1994, right before I was leaving Boston to lead a TB care and prevention project in Kosovo. A mutual friend suggested that I contact Paul given his experience with treating TB in Haiti. Paul was just starting his infectious disease fellowship at the Brigham and we met in Partners in Health's small Cambridge office in Central Square on a quiet Saturday morning. So I went to that meeting with a handful of questions and thought we might meet for about an hour. But if you knew Paul, you will not be surprised to hear that we spent eight hours together that day. The conversation just flowing easily and continuing through the afternoon as we talked through what we now know are termed the social determinants of health, health inequities, and how to ensure equitable healthcare delivery for all. But you've heard others say this, and I, I will say it in my way too, Paul had this magical gift of making you feel like you were the only person in the room at the time, the most important person standing there right in front of him. He gave you his complete and undivided attention every time. I can just imagine him shaking hands with everybody as he entered a room and, and, and locking eyes with each, uh, with each and every one of those people because that's how Paul interacted with people. He was one of the most present people I've ever met. And I always think as his prominence grew in uh, the global TB and HIV worlds, he became a bit of a celebrity. And I always think of his circle of colleagues grew as well. I always estimated into the thousands. And yet he retained that ability 
to connect sincerely and authentically with people that he had met years, decades before. I don't think he ever forgot anyone that he ever met. So I was in touch with Paul just a few months ago about one of his students. And again, as Joe O'Donnell reminded us, I marveled at how deep his connection to his students are as I think his commitment to humanity came so naturally and was felt so passionately because of his ability to connect with others. The way in which he wrote letters of recommendations for students are like no other letters of recommendation you will ever see written. He, he just was able to dive so deeply into knowing and understanding a person. So while there are many things that we know will and, and do deserve recognition as part of Paul's life and legacy, the clinics he built in rural Haiti, Rwanda, and elsewhere, the policies that he changed so that everyone now has access to treatment for drug-resistant tuberculosis, the status quo that he disrupted in healthcare delivery, and so many of his other triumphs, I do sincerely hope it's his ability to connect with and care for every patient, for every student, every colleague, and every friend as the unique and worthy individual that they are will also stand out among the contributions he made to this world. He taught us that important singular lesson that the pandemic has only reinforced for us. We need to take care of each other, always. Now, Paul would be the first to say, his, this work is not about one person. And I can hear him saying right now over my shoulder, stop talking about me. Get on with the important work at hand. And that by doubling down on our commitment to global health equity is the best way that we can honor his memory. For us to reflect and think about the contributions we have and can make contributions, big or small, through our individual and collective actions to promoting global health equity, I know that's what Paul is asking us to do. So let's get on with it. Thank you. So Lisa surfaced a new element, which is the student piece, springboarding off some of our other speakers. And uh, our next speaker, Molly Bodie, is a, was a student here at Dartmouth College. Uh, I'm going to let her describe why she's not here, but instead sent us a recording of her time here. And you get to hear a little bit about that impact that the care and focus made on one of our Dartmouth students. Thank you. Hi, all. Uh, my name is Molly Bodie. I'm a Dartmouth 09, and I used to work for the president's office for President Jim Kim, and then also for the Dartmouth Center for Healthcare Delivery Science. I wish that I could be there with you in person, um, but unfortunately I have uh, personal circumstances. I'm getting married, uh, so I cannot be there uh, today. Uh, and I only wish that it was under more joyous circumstances um, that we are gathered here as a Dartmouth community. Um, Paul Farmer has undoubtedly had such a strong impact on uh, myself, on many, many generations of students, not only at Dartmouth and others, but also on the broader uh, global public health community. Uh, when I was first entering Dartmouth, uh, way back when, uh, I read Mountains Beyond Mountains. It was our freshman year book, and it is uh, undoubtedly something that changed my own career and life. Uh, it is something that, as soon as I read it, uh, recognized even more deeply the inequalities that existed throughout the world in healthcare, as well as, more importantly, surfaced what the opportunity was and that uh, there really was hope to be able to improve healthcare for all. Um, no matter what country, no matter what background you're from, and Paul Farmer really could show that was possible. Um, the book also actually uh, exposed me to Dr. Jim Young Kim, and uh, when his name came up in the presidential search committee uh, around 20, 2009, 2008, 2009, um, the book was the reason I recognized his name in the search committee, and it was a huge reason why uh, the search committee, uh, including myself, uh, really were excited about Professor uh, Jim Kim 
uh, and president who became President Jim Kim, who was uh, co-founders of Partners in Health with Paul Farmer and uh, with uh, really supported global public health globally with folks like Dr. Jaime Bayona, who I know is with us here today as well. Um, and uh, it was a huge reason why we sort of brought this, uh, brought President Kim to the community and was so grateful to have him here for a number of years in the community. Um, Paul Farmer also influenced uh, with Jim Kim uh, action in Haiti. So in 2010, Earth, uh, unfathomable earthquake hit Haiti, uh, absolutely was devastated, devastating. And given the infrastructure that Paul, Jim, many others had set up, and uh, really, truly the inspiration um, and sort of call to action, we had thousands of individuals from the Dartmouth community come out from the woodwork to help send 6, 000, uh, six planes to Haiti, thousands of pounds of medical supplies from Dartmouth Hitchcock, Hitchcock and Dartmouth, and then additionally uh, send medical professionals. Uh, dozens of medical professionals went down to, to help and thousands of, uh, of community members, including students, helped organize around the, the earthquake. Um, and not only did we you know, support directly in the crisis, but also helped strengthen health systems longer term through work on TB, HIV, uh, health systems training, uh, and so really were able to um, to really help and gather together all uh, due to the inspiration from from Jim, from Paul, and from others. Uh, and not only did Paul sort of have an influence on us uh, through the Dartmouth Haiti work, but also through uh, he really helped us strengthen connections in Rwanda, in the U.S. and the Navajo Nation, and many other places. Uh, and can't thank him enough for giving that opportunity to us as a community, as well as um, to to students at Dartmouth. Um, when Paul's death. Uh, you know, came through, I got a number of texts from individuals um, saying, you know, did you know Paul Farmer died? Sorry, I'm crying. Um, uh, and I uh, was obviously first very, very shocked and saddened by the news, um, just thinking, you know, how could this beacon of inspiration for global public health for thousands of students across the world um, have passed? Is this really, really true? Um, over time, recognize though that you know that is the that that you know as tragic as Paul's passing was that his legacy his ability to inspire people to do the what was thought to be the impossible to really advance health uh, health equity goals both in the US and abroad would live on through those thousands of students and thousands of global public health community members that he inspired and um, I'm just so grateful for his influence on our community, his influence on me personally, and his influence on the world. Um, millions of lives have, have certainly been saved, uh, uh, you know, thanks to his legacy. So thank you all for having me. I'm sorry again that I can't be there in person, and I'm sending you lots of uh, love and uh, I know personally, I'll try to continue to walk on and do my part in global public health from here on out. And thanks again to you, Dr. Paul Farmer. Love you all. Bye. Molly's getting married on Saturday and stepped aside to do this for us. So we are quite grateful. And I think it's a good indication of the connection and the power that Paul had in her life. Our uh, next a uh, person also comes to us through a recording. Uh, this person is actually in the air right now on their way to Columbia. And uh, he was referenced actually in Molly's piece. Uh, Dr. Jaime Bayona will be joining now. Dear members of Dartmouth community, thank you for the opportunity to share with you some reflections about my dear friend, Dr. Paul Farmer. I met Ophelia, Jim, and Paul back in September 94, when they asked me to join Partners in Health and founded the Peruvian branch, Socios in Salud. Let me share with you one example of how Paul has been influential to so many people around the world. I will use the story of Eda, 
another student who joined the health team and treated the first group of multidrug resistant tuberculosis patients in Peru. Paul showed us how to provide care to the patients, their relatives, and their respective communities. The medical rounds were filled with high standard of health care, but also with guidance on how to care for the other needs that, fami that families may have. Very soon, Ada took the leadership of the health team and traveled to start similar programs across the country. Years passed by and Ada was working at another organization, but still committed to communities in need. At the time, I was at Dartmouth College and I asked her if she could host a group of visiting students. She was eager to help. Ada and her team mentored the students and built a small library for the kids in the community. We also visited the health facilities where patients received care and the students were able to experience firsthand the needs of the community in terms of health care. That process of building trust, empowering the community members, listening to their needs, solving the problems with them, understanding the complexity of poverty setting in their own worlds, and working together in solving the problems. Those were lessons that Eda shared with our students outside the classroom. Through his life, Paul met many Edas around the world. And with his compassion and commitment, he brought hope where despair was the daily mood. Paul was someone we wanted to have around forever. Teams around the world expressed their gratitude in so many ways, and he always found the time to be with them and make them feel unique. It was his way to say thank you to those community members who showed him how solidarity is something we can express anywhere, anytime. I have fond memories of this picture. It was just after the first meeting with our colleagues from WHO in Cambridge. My last one was during the 25th anniversary of Socios in Salud, last year during the pandemic. It was a virtual meeting. I am going to miss him for the rest of my life, but I am optimistic new generation will continuously be inspired by Paul's legacy. One task at a time, small or big, will contribute to the changes our world needs. Paul, tu corazón dejó de latir, pero seguirá palpitando en nuestro recuerdo. Hasta siempre, amigo. What strikes me with most of the speakers, especially Jaime just now, is the humility with which they describe their own part in the story of, of Paul Farmer. And uh, what's interesting to me is the effect that all of these people we're speaking have had on our students here at Dartmouth. I'd like to turn to another student of Dartmouth, Claire Wagner, to share a little bit about her experience. Thank you, Don. Thank you and Lisa and the Dickey Center and Dartmouth community for the opportunity to share some memories about Paul. So um, I currently head up corporate strategy at the Bill and Melinda Gates Medical Research Institute. Uh, and I'm also an associate scientist in medicine in the division of global health equity at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, both roles of which trace back to Paul. But my first experience my first experience meeting Paul was while I was a student here at Dartmouth um, 15 years ago. And after meeting him, then in both Lisa's and Sienna Craig's classes, I got to read many of Paul's books and articles, discuss them in class, apply them out in the world. And inspired by this learning about Paul and about global health at Dartmouth, um, through working with Lisa and Sienna and Jim, 
I ultimately had the opportunity of a lifetime uh, after I graduated to move to Kigali, Rwanda, to work with Dr. Agnes, who you just heard from earlier, um, and for Paul. So it's very full circle, um, very heartwarming and heartbreaking, I should say, um, to be with you all here under these circumstances this evening, to remember our friend, our chief accompaniateur, and our teacher. Paul was a lot of things to a lot of people, and that is an understatement. And just like Dr. O'Donnell just shared, he was known for staying at his lectures, after his lectures, to speak with every single student or attendee who wanted to meet him. And on the occasions when I was in charge of making sure he arrived at his next engagement on time, I have to admit, this sometimes drove me nuts. But Paul knew exactly what he was doing in spending time with each person, much as he did with each patient or each partner in health. He was showing us all that in the very wise words of my friend Stephanie Novak, and just like you've heard in all of the earlier speakers tonight, that for Paul, all it took to be worthy of his time was to be a human being. It didn't matter what your status was, it just mattered that you were a person. And Paul also knew exactly what he was doing in 2011 at the Gorillas Hotel in Kigali when he asked me to print a document that he needed very urgently. I went to the front desk and asked and came back and I said, look, Paul, the internet's out and the printer's not working, sorry. He looked at me incredulously and I got the message. So I sprinted to another hotel nearby with a flash drive and I printed that document and I sprinted back. See, he said, I saw. You could remove the word printer here and insert just about anything and the story would read the same. As some would tell Paul, there's no way you can treat cancer in Rwanda or Haiti, Paul. There's no clinic nearby. You won't be able to treat that patient, Paul. There's no surgical services there, Paul. You can't perform surgery. Paul often likened this house of no to the gates of Mordor from Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, Paul's favorite. He once insisted on actually having this giant photo of the gates of Mordor in one of his slides in an academic talk about access to cancer medicines. To the house of no, Paul would say, see, and we saw. To his very core, Paul rejected the house of no, and that rejection moved mountains. It built hospitals. It founded universities. It changed paradigms. It inspired countless students and colleagues around the world, and it even printed documents. Paul showed us how one person can shape history, how one person can shape the world around him. He showed us what it meant to be the best versions of ourselves. A few weeks before he died, Paul texted me about the newest addition to my family, ending the text with, lucky world. Yes, and also lucky us, Paul, to have been accompanied by you for as long as we were. Thank you. Claire, thank you so much for that. That was very powerful in many, many ways. I, uh, I'm loving the thread of hope that is stringing through all of this. So thank you for sharing that as well. And thank you for taking the time. Uh, Dartmouth has been affected in lots of different ways, including preparing people to be here with us. And with that in mind, I'd love to welcome Chelsea Kivlin up to share a little bit about her time. Thank you for inviting me to speak this evening about Paul Farmer and to be in your company. I am humbled by the um, just beautifully eloquent and insightful comments that have been made. And that humility, though, is also inspiring me in, this, in the ways in which thinking about how we together are a community and 
can make change in the world. I um, am the other doctor of Paul Farmer's doctors, um, in the sense of a doctor of anthropology. And um, I became acquainted with um, Paul Farmer through his anthropological writings, and in particular this book, Aids and Accusation, Haiti and the Geography of Blame, that was his, um, his doctoral dissertation work in anthropology that then became this book where he um, both told a deep history, as he, he would say, um, it, a story that was historically deep and geographically broad. And that was very much, that's, that's this book, that it um, analytically, covered everything. <laughs> There's this huge section of um, the book, the middle section, that goes into that deep history and brings us back to the colonial era in Saint-Domingue, in Haiti, through uh, the contemporary period. And he once told me that he um, was questioned about why to include that history. Wasn't that just you know, a section that one skips over as they're reading to sort of move back to the contemporary ethnography. And he said, well, to me that was, that was the story. And that, was the, and, and that story was the explanation. We don't, we don't come to an understanding of the predicament of Haiti and of many Haitian people today without going through that entire history. And it's something that I have continued um, to attempt to do, <laughs> um, and, and certainly not as well, but to think about the issues of Haiti today through that long history. So I think I forgot to say that I'm an anthropologist <laughs> of, um, of Haiti and a professor here at Dartmouth. Uh, very much inspired by Paul Farmer. I also wanted to, um, I didn't know Paul Farmer that, that well. Um, we never worked um, closely together on a project, but I felt that I have acquired um, an intimacy with him through his writings and trying to continue the, both the thematics of his writing, the content, thinking about inequity, um, and all the different ways in which that affects people's lives, but then also the, the methodology, the real care he brought to the ethnographic project of forming not just, I'm going to go and do a couple of interviews or a survey, but I'm going to go and I'm going to live somewhere for a while, for, for decades, <laughs> to, to go back to and to be a part of people's lives, and that's where I get my... Um, my evidence, right, for the kinds of arguments I want to make. Um, but I do have one important memory of Paul Farmer, which was um, right before I began my dissertation, my field work for my dissertation in Haiti, there was a Haitian Studies Association conference that I attended, and um, I was young <laughs> and nervous, and... Um, <laughs> I remember giving the talk, and he was in the audience. I don't really remember. Well, I actually do remember what the talk was about. But what I really remember was just those feelings of, of nervousness and, and knowing that it was resonating in my voice and how I was presenting myself and wanting, wanting, to, um, wanting to be you know, at that level of um, intelligence and articulation that I that I knew were, was um, in those listening to me. And after the talk, which I, I think went fine, probably, <laughs> but after the talk, I um, went to go get a cup of tea, and um, Dr. Farmer happened to be getting tea at the same time. And um, he, um, he turned to me. And we were we were in line together, and I was you know just thinking, I'm like you know, do I say something? Do I say hi? <laughs> just in kind of awe of this, um, you know, um, 
person of such uh, standing within our field of anthropology, and particularly the anthropology of Haiti. Um, but he turned to me and he said something that I just thought was, uh, I remember it so vividly, but he said, grow an ego. <laughs> to me, grow an ego. And um, he said, um, we must be humble, but also confident. Um, you have a lot to say. Kembe fam, hold tight in Haitian Creole. And it was a, just a way of saying, look, I know, I know starting out as a scholar, as a, um, you know, for me as a, as a young woman can be difficult. Um, but can be fam, you know, hold, hold strong, be confident in yourself and grow an ego, <laughs> you know, have, have that confidence, um, you know, to say something. And I think that brings me, brings me back to, you know, just this opening where it's been repeated often today, um, tout moon c'est moon, all people are people. But the second phrase, right, is tout moon c'est moon, mais uh, tout moon pas même. Not everyone is the same. And I, I really attribute Paul Farmer's great gift was to make us feel as part of a collective project, but at the same time, a personal contributor. And that that individual contribution was important to the collective. I think I'll end there. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that, and thank you for being part of the Dartmouth community after that. Uh, we are uh, very lucky in the different amazing minds and hearts that we somehow are lucky enough to have wander here to Dartmouth. Uh, I was in Haiti for the first time in a room, conference room somewhere, and ran into a gentleman and started talking only to find out that he lived in Norwich, Vermont, and I had never seen him before. And with that, I'd like to introduce that gentleman, Peter Wright. I thought it was in trying to get the Global Health Prize down to uh, Haiti for Bill Pop. Yes. Uh, I'd like to, I think, just to the, spend an extraordinary group of remembrances um, to talk about the, the happy, but an element of wistful side of Paul. Uh, one of my first memories is seeing him uh, <clears throat> in our living room with a, a group of students. I was at Vanderbilt at that time. And uh, they were like acolytes. Mm -hmm. He was sitting in a chair in the corner, and the students were. Uh, sitting at his feet, so to speak. Um, and then, uh, as some of you men know, I, I work extensively in Haiti, um, still trying to do that, difficult task though it may be. I was on a call last night about um, a little town in southern Haiti where we're trying to uh, help with recovery from the most recent earthquake. I have, have, have happy memories of Paul. Um, we were at, uh, with the band Ram. Ah, at the Hotel Montana, and he was dancing and disappeared up the stairs, sort of with a long scarf, strung out behind him. And then uh, later, we had, a, with, with Bill Pop, who I mentioned, um, another hero of, of Haiti and the world, really, uh, a symposium with Paul, uh, half of which was down in Port-au-Prince, half of which was up in Cange. And um, he would, uh, the opening in Kanj of this meeting, I will never forget, it was in the church with uh, choir and everything else. And uh, just a, 
amazing break, if you will, from uh, a long day or two that we had had um, down in, in Port-au-Prince and an introduction to uh, this community that was so much a part of what he did um, in anthropology and in medicine. For some reason, I, uh, I decided to circle some quotes from a writer who you will guess very quickly, I'm sure, that um, I think personified much of what um, was remarkable about Paul. Everybody's talked about his energy and his dedication to his patients, but uh, he was also, a, I, I think, really a blithe uh, spirit. So the quotes I, I chose of, of many were, the moment you doubt whether you can fly, you cease forever to be able to do it. Never say goodbye, because goodbye means going away, and going away means forgetting. I don't think Paul ever forgot, as you've heard, uh, of people of countries that he was devoted to. I'll teach you how to jump the winds back, and then away we go. This particularly struck me. Dreams do come true if only we wish hard enough. You can have anything in life, but if you sacrifice everything else, but you will sacrifice everything else for it. Another one, oh, the cleverness of me. Um, and he was a very clever person. Absence makes the heart grow fonder and forgetful. On these magic shores, children at play are forever beaching their coracles. We too have been there. We can still hear the sound of the surf, though we shall land no more. One that I, he was a scholar for, for certain, but he was a doer too. I don't want to go to school and learn solemn things. The difference between him and the other boys at such time was as they knew it was make-believe, while to him make-believe and true were exactly the same thing. This sometimes troubled them as when they had to make-believe that they had had their dinners. Uh, so all quotes from Peter Pan. Um, And uh, somehow that, those, you know, those are Im important to me. Um, that uh, he was relentless and uh, infatigable, but he was also a, a, a wonderful person and a real friend. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we are now going to close the arc for this hour uh, with Brian sharing one more story. Well, I want to thank everybody. This has been amazing. It's been great to be with with such close friends around this time. Um, so I, I think we're here in, on all the campuses, the, the college, the medical school, and the hospital. You know, our, our job is to make sure this work carries on. Um, and uh, as hard as it, and impossible as it seems, our job is to fill his shoes. Um, I was in my mid-50s before I found this calling, which changed my life. But, it, and I, uh, uh, Paul's, career trajectory and mine are quite different, and there are many, many reasons for that. Um, but I want to, we started out with some similarities. Paul and I were both born in North Adams to uh, poor families. I was three years older than Paul. We both picked the colleges we went to based on whether we could drive to them, partly. 
Um, we both went to Harvard Medical School. Paul embraced being poor. He lived on a bus. Um, poverty didn't scare him. I was terrified of being poor. I had a chance to go to the Schweitzer Hospital and work in Gabon when I was at Harvard, and all I had to do was sign up. But I was afraid to interrupt my studies and my career path. And so here at the Dickey Center, I just wonder if there were students or faculty who would do more local and distant equity desert work if they didn't have that insecurity. And so I think that's something that we need to look at. I also think we need to look for diamonds in the rough. Um, Paul applied for a Fulbright scholarship and didn't even get interviewed. He got a thousand, this is all stuff you can find on YouTube. Um, he got a thousand dollar grant and he used the money to go to Haiti and that changed his life. Um, he took one course in medical anthropology. He wasn't a global health scholar. He took one course and that changed his life. So I think that we need to, um, to think about that when we, we the students that, that even have a, a tangential interest, we have to make it available to them. So Paul would remind us that we are his retirement plan. He said that many times about many people, particularly young students. In one of his books, and I paraphrase, he said, I go to bed worrying about all the promises I have made. <laughs> and I wake up worrying that I've not made enough promises. So when I finish here, <clears throat> I'm going to text him on WhatsApp and say, no worries, man. We got your back. Thank you. I just want to close with a thank you. Thank you to everybody who's online. Thank you to those who are here. And thanks for sharing this hour of stories, uh, healing and inspiration, especially those who shared their own personal stories. It's very powerful in the wake of our grieving. As I mentioned to a couple of people, we will post a link to this. We want these stories to be out there so others can listen to them and be inspired and heal with them. Uh, I encourage anyone to stay behind and can reconnect with people you haven't seen in a little bit. I hope we all remember his legacy and keep taking care of each other. Thank you very much. <laughs>